My name is Brian Watson. I'm an operations manager with BSBC. Today I'm presenting uh, from the traditional territory of the Tanaka people. Um, today we are joined by Elise Laird, the FSBC communication consultant, Steve Kazuki, the FSBC executive director, and Nino Ramadani with PwC, and Dan Nadir with PwC. Today, our presentation is going to be 60, min 60 minutes long. Uh, first, we're going to discuss some history behind FESBC and our wildfire risk reduction program. Uh, we're going to talk about the new program overview that many of you have uh, called in today to, to find out about. Um, we're going to have about 10 minutes for some uh, questions uh, and answers on the new funding program. And then we're going to turn it over to PwC, where they're going to discuss. Uh, the Pheasants Overview, um, which is the system we use to take applications for our program, uh, followed by some questions with our PwC partners, uh, and then we'll open it up uh, for general questions in the event there's extra time. Um, we have a lot to cover today. Uh, we wanted to leave time for questions, of course. So we ask that people will please type their questions into the chat box, and Elise will read those questions after the presentations. I will now introduce Steve Kazuki, FSBC Executive Director, to tell us a bit about our history and where we are going. Good afternoon, Steve. Thanks, Brian, and, and welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm just thrilled to see how many of you are, are out there and interested in this funding program. And uh, many of you are, are old friends. Uh, I recognize quite a few names that I uh, in the list there. and. To everyone else, hopefully you'll become a new friend. Um, we're very excited about having yet another round of funding uh, 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 available to you. Uh, about six years ago was when FAST first got started, created by the provincial government okay. to be an independent society. Hello, can you hear me? All right. You can hear me, Steve. Yeah, I was muted. Uh, yeah, we were an independent society. We got $85 million, followed by uh, 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 150 and three, and now 25. So that's great. I don't imagine that you're terribly interested in, in the FEST history, and for good reason. You're forward looking people, and you want to know uh, about the funding program going forward. Next slide, please. So we have this $25 million of new money. Brian is going to talk about uh, what, uh, what types of projects we're, we're looking for uh, going forward. And, um, and I just wanna thank everybody again um, that the, uh, for, your, for your interest, you know, FES, we have a philosophy where we're customer oriented. You are the customer. Uh, the job, I've always told the operations manager, their job in the intake uh, stage is to help you to be successful. And, and it's rooted in the belief that your local people, you know what, what best, what, what needs to happen in, in your backyard. And so we're looking to you, the local experts in, in your forest, to bring forward great projects. And we've had some amazing ones, very transformational, not just, you know, one off, we improved the stand of trees here and there, or we did certain projects, but they create lasting benefits. And not just for the forest, but for, for, for wildlife, for the people of British Columbia. And, and with the fiber utilization component of our program, we're also accelerating the transition from, uh, to a lower timber supply in the province. You're, you're all aware of that. And using that wood rather than wasting it is also not only creates economic activity and creates jobs and, and, and some stability in some forest dependent communities, but it's also helping BC and Canada meet our climate change targets internationally. And so this funding program, very important part of it is to help uh, accelerate the transition to, to a new bio, larger bioeconomy in British Columbia. So 
Thanks, Brian. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Steve. So the new program funding. Um, we've assumed that people on the call today have had a chance to look through the funding guide uh, that's uh, located on the FESBC website. Um, the direction of this funding round comes from a direction letter um, that was provided to FESBC by the Minister of Forest. Um, and this too is located on the website. Um, within this direction letter, uh, it speaks to what Steve just mentioned. Um, the $25 million that we've been given is to be spent um, on wildfire risk reduction projects uh, in communities within BC. Um, really what we're trying to do is, is to find uh, the sweet spot where we're utilizing fiber that's being created uh, from these projects. Um, we're looking to, of course, uh, mimic somewhat the BC Wildfire Services Program where we're trying to focus the money in the highest risk areas of the province. Um, we're trying to use a lot of the infrastructure that they have in place and that some of our, our proponents from before also have in place where they're using the, the, the tools and the practices to achieve the, the end goal of, of reducing the hazard around these communities. Um, and then, uh, and then we're, you know, a lot of this, a lot of what we hear today is, is uh, complementing what BC Wildfire Services uh, aligning with the district offices and, and the and the fuel specialists to make sure that we're not all uh, running off madly in different directions, but we're focused on the priorities within each district. And of course, uh, the society has had so much success working with Indigenous people previously, um, and we are being asked to continue on this great work. Um, so we have our eye on this as well. Um, so these these are important words. Our, our board bases their decisions on the direction from the minister. As such, the guidebook, the project rating scheme, and the final decision to fund are all based on the proponent's ability to communicate how their project is aligned with this letter. Um, as Steve said, as operations manager, it's Gordon, my jobs um, to, to help you guys be successful, to communicate what you're doing in clear terms to the board so that they can actually adjudicate with the best information at hand. Um, the funding objectives, again, uh, are to fund planning and wildfire fire risk reduction treatment activities, so both planning and treatments. Um, there is a, um, a, a, I guess, a bias, I'll say, to do more treatments, um, knowing that, you know, this work is, is, is long been required and uh, I think the board really wants to see us get as many many hectares treated as possible. Um, it's located in the highest risk areas of BC. Again we're trying to promote utilization and um, at the forefront of this is we're trying to complement uh, district and BC wildfire services staff. Um, generally government does not or limits the funding of treatments in will be risk class three and four project areas. Um, again, FES is also focused on funding will we risk class one and two over over a three and four. Um, but but we will consider funding three and four projects as a complementary approach to government and local strategies that exist. So uh, we don't want to limit uh, where we're doing the work, but everyone needs to know that we need to be in the uh, risk one and two um, as, as a priority. So. Um, the assessment of the application, um, I think that the document's fairly long, um, but it's, you know, it, it, it reads fairly well. We, we did put as much, a, a lot of time into it. Um, the guidebook criteria, criteria are what is used to score. So ultimately page five and six is where you guys should go if you get stuck on what, what you think we need to see and hear. Um, again, the criteria comes from the direction and mandate letter uh, given to FESBC uh, by the minister. And, and of course, FESBC priorities, uh, they're on the website as well. Uh, we're looking for some kind of alignment with the other things that we're trying to do, uh, whether it be wildlife management or, or something else. And our board's very clear on this, the value for money is important. Um, to the extent that excessive costs and some of the criteria may disqualify applicants. We're looking for fair, fair rates um, 
that uh, mimic, you know, what the market price is and, and knowing that the market price is changing rapidly now, um, we are looking to, uh, to get value for money across the board. Um, what is value for money? How are we going to determine this? And what does it look like? Um, well, we, we have previous project cost information um, that we, you know, PwC has on our behalf uh, to us, and we can use that to establish fairness. Um, another thing that uh, proponents should be uh, aware of is that we're, we've done away with the delivery allowance moving forward. Um, we're establishing a set admin cost over a D uh, delivery allowance. Um, and this is just enables fairness for applicants. And it's a little bit administratively clear for PwC and FESBC moving forward. Um, now we're looking for, you know, anticipated costs. Uh, we don't expect people to fund projects on their own dime, but we don't expect them to get rich on it either. So um, again, excessive administrative costs uh, could lead to a, a project being uh, disqualified. Um, utilization cost model template uh, requires some research and or work. Uh, reach out to us for help. Um, that's located on the information tab of FES IMS and is really the, the way that we calculate, you know, how much extra money is going to need to utilize that fiber. Um, I touched on the point that excessive costs will work against applicants to the extent where some will be disqualified. Um, supporting cost sheets bid sheets, project management outputs that are used to po populate the cost template should be included. Um, we're looking for as much information on how you guys got to your costs um, so, that we, so that we can be comfortable that we are getting that value for money. Um, the last comment here is applicants should consider any revenue generated through the sale of fiber will go against project costs. Again, uh, this is the selection criteria on page five. Uh, there's other things to consider that uh, morph onto page six as well. Um, but if you get stuck in your application, go back to these criteria and, and speak to this. Tell us your story and tell us how they're aligned with, with this thinking. Um, we don't have the FEST priorities here, and I mentioned them earlier, but um, you know, they, they include improving damaged or low-value forests, improving habitat for wildlife, supporting the use of fiber from damaged or low-value forests, um, and treating forests to improve the management of greenhouse gases. Uh, so that's what's uh, on our website, a big part of the organization. Uh, but there's other cool benefits that you that may be realized with your project, and we want to hear about those as well. Um, basically, a good application uh, will have uh, a good description of the work proposed, uh, good maps attached, indicate how far along in the approval process you currently are. Um, again, we've got that March 15th, 2024 timeframe where we want to have this work done. So... Uh, you know, the projects that are advanced, projects that might have uh, already some uh, authorizations in place uh, are going to be good indicators that the project will get done sooner than later. Um, we're looking for alignment with a land manager, whether it's actually on an AOP, whether it's uh, uh, a note to the, to the land manager or from the land manager saying we have met with proponent X, We've discussed their project and it is aligning with our uh, strategic planning. Um, you know, that's the, that we need that uh, in order to, you know, ensure that we are all pulling in the right direction. Uh, again, we're looking for good detail on costs, um, evidence of completion within target date. And then, um, you know, people that have worked with us in the past, um, we're looking for your work experience and, and, um, and people that are like qualified to do this kind of work. Um, so that's a general overview on the, on the, on the intake, on the, on the program guide and, and what we're looking for as managers. Um, we've got 10 minutes to take questions before we pass it over to our partners at PwC. Perfect. We've got a couple of questions and just a reminder to everybody that you can start, uh, adding your questions to the chat. 
Um, so Brian, first question from Heather, will the higher treatment costs on the coast be differentiated from the lower costs in the interior or is just one average cost per hectare being used? Um, when we score projects, we have a, a graduate, there's graduations on costs. Um, of course, the cheaper projects are, um, are, you know, get more points than the more expensive ones. Um, but where, where your projects are, are expensive, um, you know, we tell us why, uh, you know, right, right. Um, you know, we need to know. Is it steep slope? Is it uh, mechanical? Um, we realize that some of the costs on the coast are higher just because of those, because of uh, terrain. Um, we, we need you to tell us, you know, what's going on. And we also need you to, you know, submit more supporting information so that we can um, flag that for the board. Heather, if you have a follow-up, if you want to just uh, send, put that into the chat as well. Hopefully that answered your question. Uh, another question for you, Brian, um, from Scott. Are other Indigenous governing bodies eligible or only First Nations? Um, wondering, Scott, other, other governing bodies. Can you give me an example? Are you yeah, there, there we go. Sorry, Brian. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, maybe it's just a, 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 a misnomer, but I'm so with like First Nations, are you talking about like um, elected chief and councils representing communities, or are you talking about um, could, a, could, a, could a group of First Nations people apply, or could a First Nation business apply? Or, or is it just the sort of the definition of First Nation? Yeah, they, they could apply, Scott. Okay, cool. Um, uh, but they, they too would need some sort of uh, letter saying that they're aligned with the, the district or be, uh, wildfire services staff. Yes. Cool, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, for Indigenous peoples, uh, I guess the first stop is the... Uh, is the the First Nation the the governing body, but it could be uh, a company that's wholly owned by Indigenous people and and representative of the the First Nation. Uh, on occasion, Scott, it could be individuals who own companies, but uh, as Brian said, they would need to be uh, we we would need to have some comfort that they're they're in fact uh, authorized to represent the First Nation. Uh, in outside of Indigenous people, we, we accept applications from anyone, whether it's a municipality, regional district, uh, community association, could be a forest tenure holder, um, government, the BC government. We, we have not ever turned away anyone um, from applying. All right, Scott, if you have a follow-up, you can uh, pop that into the chat as well. Hopefully that answered your question. Uh, another question here from Jennifer. What steps should community forests that have projects in the district AOPs take to move their projects from the CL WRR over to FESBC? Um, the community forests, Jen, should make application. They must make application um, because the process in which we pick proponents is all competitively um, de derived or based on. So you, you can't, um, <laughs> it's just not, a, if you're on the ALP, it's just not a matter of like switching funders, uh, the BC government versus FEST. You, you must make application. Does that answer your question, Jen? Yes, it does. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Jen. Uh, another question here uh, is, are only projects in the WUI risk class polygons eligible? 25 plus structures or simple WUIs, six plus structures as well? Um, we are, we have funded in the past landscape level fuel breaks um, outside of, outside of the communities. Um, we are really dependent on the 
the applicants, if there's a, if there's a many applications within uh, risk class one and two, then, you know, it's likely we're going to put most of our energy into those or most of our funds into those. Um, if there's projects that are in the landscape or out, outside of the, of the community and in, in risk class, like three, four, um, then we, we may fund them depending, depending on the number of applicants. Um, I, I would, I mean, <laughs> I told you a lot there. Uh, we're really dependent. We need as many good applications as possible. Um, but, you know, as, as, we, as we see what happens there on July 12th, we'll, we'll, we'll have an assessment there and um, report to the board uh, with all the applications to tell them, you know, what, where they are and what they are, and, and they'll, they'll adjudicate then. Steve, did you want to add something to that? Sure, Brian. Yeah, our, our philosophy at FAST is we've never been, uh, I guess, held hostage by the WUI concept and a hard two kilometer uh, perimeter around a community. Our objective is to protect communities. And sometimes that means that we need to fund treatments that go outside of the WUI at the landscape level. And, and so that just makes sense. Um, at the same time, um, you know, that, as Brian says, we're gonna prioritize uh, the allocation of the scarce funding to those that need it the most and where it provides the, the highest degree of protection and where there's the greatest amount of vulnerability. Uh, having said that, I, I want to encourage everyone to apply for as much as you can. And the reason for that is, is, is strategic, is that the bigger inventory, so even if we can't fund all of your great projects, um, that's a good thing. Because what that does is it gives me an inventory of shovel-ready, uh, unfunded projects. And that list of unfunded projects, in turn, helps demonstrate that there's a need for more funding. So it's a reinforcing it, itself. When the more, the more demand there is and the more need there is, then the greater the likelihood that we're gonna get more funding to do it. So don't hold back, that's my message. Uh, submit as many applications as you can. Awesome. Um, this was sent to me in a direct message. So I'm just gonna ask it uh, to you, Brian. Uh, no one else will have seen this question yet, but isolated First Nation villages may not show up in WUI mapping. Is there a way of moving them up in the queue? Uh, um, there has been times when uh, communities that have uh, asked for funds from FESBC are, are class, class four uh, based on based on timber types that might be out of out of line. And when we've looked at them, they're actually risk class one or two. Um, you know, we're, we, we would, we would, we would be open. We welcome those applications for sure. Um, and we can have a, you know, a, a, a look at them um, on the, on July 11th and go from there. Um, it, you know, should be noted. And, and there was a community that reached out to us last week, wondering if the funds are, or can be used on federal lands? And the answer to that is no, it's just on BC Crown lands right now. All right, uh, two more questions in the, three more questions in the chat. Uh, the next one is from Brittany. Would a project looking to abate a fire hazard from an already cleared area by grinding and hauling fiber to a biomass facility rather than pile burning be an eligible project? We would be applying for funding to help cover increased costs of grinding and hauling of biomass. Um, I think the intent of the funding was for us to utilize fiber from uh, FESBC sponsored um, WRR treatments. Um, I would say no to that, um, but a conversation, you know, I, I, maybe I'd, I'd like to understand more of what, what's being presented there. Okay, great. And I can, uh, Brian, I, I've got Brittany's contact information. I can connect the two of you as well. Uh, we have a question. I'm just going to skip down to Heather's because it was based on what Steve just said. So based on what Steve just said, perhaps considering providing an expression of interest option as a first cut instead of requiring the extensive amount of information for a full application that is unlikely to get funded. So more of a comment. Steve didn't know if you had anything to say regarding that. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Thank you, Brittany. Okay, um, two more questions here. 
Uh, from John, can you confirm prescribed or cultural burning where it is undertaken to abate fuel hazard will be considered a risk reduction treatment? Yes. Yes, we, we have that and you'll note that on the cost, uh, the cost sheet that we have is a, is a, a place for you to fill in the costs for sure. Um, of course, being mindful that it's in one or one and two risk classes. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, last question, though there will be time for additional questions uh, at the end of this uh, session today as well. Um, this question is from Gord. Uh, Brian, can you explain the difference between delivery allowance and administration costs? I, can I? Would Dan, Dan Adir might be better to talk about delivery allowance, but delivery allowance is something that was offered um, historically to, to proponents to cover off um, the cost of running an office and, and, and you know, keeping the lights on. Um, at the same time, there was other costs that were given outside of that that kind of sounded like, uh, de like delivery allowance costs. Um, there was a lot, there's, there's been a lot of gray area in the past around, is that delivery allowance or is that actually um, administration or another, another fee we can charge? Um, because our program has evolved and because the use of the delivery allowance has sort of evolved with it, uh, we felt that going to an administration cost, five, six, whatever, whatever's presented to us um, is, is easier for both the proponent and for, uh, for us to make sure that, you know, we're not double counting costs. And, um, and yeah, that's the big thing. Um, you know, when we, when we ask people for administration costs, we're, we're being fair. Um, don't short yourself. Uh, but you know, it, 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 it can, if it gets out of hand, it can be one of those line items or one of those parts of the application that you can be disqualified on. Um, uh, we, we want people to be whole through this process. Uh, and we're, we're looking for fair, fair compensation for those administration costs. All right, well, Brian, that's the end of the questions that I see uh, right now in the chat. So if you wanna unshare your screen so that uh, Nino can share his screen, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. Let me know when you can see that. Yeah, you're good, Nino. Oh, excellent. I'm gonna post the, uh, I'll just post the link for everybody in the FES, the FES IMS Outcome Plus link. Now, if this is your first time visiting the site, this is a screen that you'll see. And if you haven't registered yet, you will need to register to uh, be able to submit your proposal. And if you just hit register now, I, I, I hit, I'm, I'm not going to proceed with this, but you would just have to enter your email address um, and then a verification code will be sent to your email address and your account is essentially created and then you'll be logged in and you'll have to enter your uh, details in your organization when you do submit your uh, proposal. So I'm going to log in. So this is the <clears throat> home screen once you're logged in to FES IMS. Uh, you'll see this call notification here. Uh, which is a call for the Forest Enhancement Society of BC 2223 funding program. And then you'll basically hit hit apply now and it'll take you to to read the terms of uh, the terms and conditions which you'll open here and once you've done that and you hit accept. You out, you have to identify your uh, proponent's organization, your select yourself a title and then the primary purpose, which is very simple this time around. WRR, and uh, once this is completed, I won't do this part, but you'll basically be taken to the screen that then uh, allows you to enter all the details for your proposal. And I will select the proposal that we have uh, in draft. Uh, this is one that we did as PWC, just to have an example to show um, everybody that, that is submitting a proposal. So now this is essentially uh, the screen that where you're entering all your information. Uh, it's separated by these tabs here, terms and conditions, project overview, financial plan, applicant eligibility, and then the project description. If you click on any of these tags here, it'll highlight that particular section for you. 
you click it again, it'll just minimize everything. And you can also just access it by clicking on the actual uh, tab here as well. You can actually open them all up if you wanted to. Um, so if we go into the financial plan, because this is sort of when you start. So essentially, project information is actually where you start. Um, and the project information will have uh, everything that has a red asterisk is a required entry field. So this, that will have to uh, have some kind of, pop, uh, it ha it'll have to be populated essentially. Uh, the first bit here is pretty simple. It's just uh, information about the project, project title, primary purpose, country, et cetera. Uh, this is important, the contact email and the principal contact name, that will be the person that will be speaking with, you know, myself or any of the other investment managers They'll be speaking with Fest. Uh, that person will be uh, kind of the main, the main uh, point of contact. And after this section, you will get into uh, the financial plan. And it starts with the annual budget. Um, now, this section here, that it, you basically, um, it, this is a high, I would say it's a high level overview of the information that will be. Uh, that you will provide in the cost model. Now the cost model and um, any other information you can find in this information tab up here um, where we've kind of added a whole ton of resources uh, for proponents, different guides and stuff. And the one that's important, well, several, several are important. The one that uh, the funding program guide to submitting a proposal, if you're, if you're doing this, uh, you'll have you should have this this document open and it'll basically provide additional information for any of the fields that you're populating in the proposal and then this here is the project cost template and let me know i'm going to actually open this and then please let me know if you're able to see it once it is open but excel is a little slow there we go Okay, there we go. Uh, uh, are you guys able to see this? Are folks able to see this one? Yep, yeah, you're good. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so this here is sort of a, I'll, I'll let Brian get into the details of this thing, but this thing should, this document should uh, very closely resemble the financial plan where we're breaking down costs by the cost category and we're applying some, uh, some sort of um, values to the project here. And this should reflect what is in here, but this document is in much more detail. Brian, do you wanna take a, take a minute and talk about this document? Sure. Um, uh, it's fairly intuitive. Um, the biggest thing from here is, is that we, we've taken, um, we've isolated the, supervision um, uh, component uh, uh, out of administration. So it's a separate line item for that. Um, uh, John asked earlier about prescribed fire, culturally um, prescribed fire. And there's, a, there's a, some, some uh, line items at the bottom. Uh, and then this is where proponents are gonna part of put the administration cost in on that line. Uh, and sort of add and say what it includes. And, and we'll be able to sort of quickly calculate, you know, what percentage of the total cost is going to administration and make that assessment of fairness um, fairly easily. Um, so this is a, a cost sheet earlier. Someone asked about excessive costs on the post. Um, and where there is excessive costs or where a proponent feels that they want to share the supporting information that populates the the uh, cells under column E that they 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 provide secondary information um, to tell us how they got there, um, and that secondary information is anything that comes from, you know, the creation of bids. Uh, it's twenty man days at five hundred dollars uh, to get to ten thousand dollars for prescription writing or whatever. So um, we're I'm not sure if we're asking for more information on costs than we previously had, but certainly it's important to our board that we, we can determine value for money. Thanks, Brian. And uh, 
kind of to um, reemphasize, in the actual proposal, um, you see the, the subheadings or the phases, planning and development, uh, treatment implementation, prescribed burn implementation, and ad administration costs. Those will be uh, your line items here, essentially. I mean, we got a we got a administration, um, recipient, labor. The uh, let me just maximize this here. Funding by activity. So those are those are the line items, the phases that were in that cost model. Those can just be you know put put straight into this into this um, uh, funding by activity tab. Um, whereas the cost model will go into the kind of the details of that. This will just kind of give us a brief, uh, a brief overview of those costs. Um, the output categories are important because this, will, this is relating to um, basically the treatment area or survey area, depending on, on the, what the project entails. Um, start, end dates, I mean, this is very, very intuitive. Um, and then, so this is, yeah, this is essentially it for, um, for the, uh, the financial plan. I mean, the, these are the kind of the three main, the three main components. And there's a, they're definitely going to be. I mean, they should be pretty well identical to what's kind of outlined in the in the cost model that that FS is asking for. Um, after the financial plan, I'll minimize that. Uh, there's questions uh, regarding applicant uh, eligibility. Um, you identify your type of organization. Uh, provide a description. In this case, we selected a small, a small area-based tenure, including community forest. So it's a community forest agreement licensee. Um, describe the risks under mandate of the organization with regards uh, to wildfire risk reduction. Um, write us, you know, here we have written wildfire risk reduction mitigation has been incorporated into the CFA for a stewardship plan. Um, basically run down the list here and answer answer the questions that that are uh, that are asked i mean they're all fairly easy in the guide which maybe i should open that guide to show folks what that looks like as well uh, the guide that you'll find on in the information tab it basically goes through kind of line by line what is going where here basically everything that i'm telling you right now is in this document um and then uh it also goes into um, kind of additional additional information regarding, you know, what what uh, the question is asking. For example, here in this is the applicant el eligibility. That's what we're looking at right now um, down here. You know, it says uh, describe the steps required to obtain authorizations. Um, so you know, you, there's additional information written in some of these boxes that can help. Uh, kind of answer that answer that uh, question for you. And in some cases, if we go into the project description tab here, this is also pretty intuitive. Uh, a lot of these are, you're selecting a region, the resource district, the fire center management unit, this is just selected. Um, project site location, uh, the UTM zone. Uh, this is basically where the majority of your kind of the geographic area for the project is. You just kind of select the just a general area for that. Um, there, there will be places for you to attach attachments. And if you mouse over the blank space, it'll tell you what formats are acceptable. So a lot of cases it's, you know, a PDF or uh, KMZ file here. Uh, in some cases it's uh, an Excel, et cetera. The project description is, uh, we, we don't want, um, we don't necessarily want uh, essays of of information here. It should just be concise and to the point and uh, really accurate, so that whoever is looking at this can kind of get the get the picture very quickly. So in this case here, the project description, just as an example, incremental wildfire risk reduction treatments to be completed on a post harvest licensee cut block entirely within the community forest. Uh, proposed activities include. Development of a fuel management prescription by CFA staff, incremental wildfire risk reduction treatments, uh, manual pruning and piling, mechanical piling, burning of piled materials. And there's hectares that they kind of uh, put in brackets here, which is very helpful as well. And then um, the financial plan, uh, which is the 
um, that cost model that we were looking at, uh, this, this, this document right here can then be uploaded uh, into this, into this uh, spot right here. And you can see that it'll only accept an Excel format, which that document is, so you can upload that right here. Um, so as we go on, it's just asking additional questions uh pertaining to the project here uh you can see the red asterisks for what is important um you can see here that the welfare service uh, we risk classes uh you can select from a drop down um and then the fest purposes identified here um and then you explain how the project will achieve those specific purposes um so for example for this one welfare risk reduction um Wildfire risk reduction will reduce surface fuel loading and ladder fuels, which will reduce the chance of fuel ignition and fire rate of spread, very to the point. Uh, the next spot is the repository for final de deliverables. Now this should just be results reporting in most cases. It is mandatory, we're creating openings. So there will be a results uh, associated with that. Um, uh, and now this is a subsection here, the recovery and utilization of low uh, value residual fiber. Obviously not all projects will have this, but in the case that they do, um, we do, this is, uh, there should be some kind of, this isn't a red asterisk, but if you are doing fiber utilization, then this will have to be filled out as well. The residual fiber volume for those projects, that's very important. And then the plan destination as well um, for that fiber. In this case, um, you know, the plan is, to burn residual fiber from treatments. However, the applicant will explore options for recovery during the prescription development phase. So in this case, it wasn't necessarily identified um, and it would be explored later. Um, the next section is the work standards and development status. Uh, just a further list of confirmations. Confirm that all proposed activities will be consistent with the requirements as per the BC uh, Wildfire Services Tool for Fuel Management. Um, this is if, if something is quoted in here, it should be listed in here. So there's the tools for fuel management right, right there under the information. Everything that is referenced or quoted in, in, the, in here will be available to, to proponents uh, at the top here. Um, yeah, so once um, this section here is uh, important uh, and Brian alluded to it, uh, alignment with the land manager's priorities. Um, if there is uh, any correspondence that you would have with uh, land managers or, or BC Wild, uh, Wildfire Service personnel, this can be attached at the bottom here in PDF format. So if you have email correspondence, a letter, um, this, is, this is great to attach uh, at the bottom here um, as, a, as kind of proof of, uh, of the communications. Um, the last that is it. That is actually the last uh, the last tab that we fill out is the alignment with the land manager's uh, uh, priorities. So then you, uh, if you need to save it when it's in draft, you can hit save proposal as draft. And if you need to, and then once you're completed, you can hit submit full proposal and uh, best of luck. That is it. Brian, is that, uh, does that cover everything from the kind of the technical CIMS side? I think so. Yeah. Um, I would just, uh, I would just add that, you know, we really are looking for proponents to utilize the fiber. So if you are in the economic zone, if you are close to a pellet plant, um, we're looking for you to use the fiber. Um, if you are outside of that zone, uh, and require funds for incremental hauling, then tell us about that too. Um, we, we have an idea of, you know, limitations on what we want to spend, um, but we won't know until you guys tell us how much there is out there. So um, bring the fiber in for utilization is the message on that. Thanks, Nino. Thank you. So I think at least we were going to go back and just see if there was any questions for PwC now. That's correct. Uh, there's uh, Nino. Did you want me to read these out to you, or are you going to chat the those? Uh, let's see. How many questions do we have? Just, just one. You were you were very clear, obviously. 
Uh, are planning processes eligible for funds in this intake, uh, such as completion of a landscape scale wildfire risk management plan? I think that's for Brian to answer. Uh, we we will fund prescriptions, yes. Um, similar to the comment before, uh, we are we are eager to plan treatments in in, uh, but the prescriptions are considered as well. Yes, I actually had a an earlier direct message that was sent to me, which nobody else would have seen. Um, someone asked, uh, what do you mean? So this is relating to administrative costs, Brian. What do you mean by exorbitant uh, administrative costs? Um, well, I'll speak to what we were expecting for administration costs. Um, a percentage of the power bill that's related to the work that your facility is doing, a uh, percentage of the uh, admin support, uh, your clerks that are actually assigned to the to the work. Um, where any, you know, how many pay, you know, what what percentage of your paper use is is, is dedicated to our project? Um, that's the thinking we want people to have. Um, and you know, just <laughs> to start paying for uh, truck leases and and uh, you know things that might not be uh, directly related to our work uh, would 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 be excessive in our mind there, you know. Okay. And I mean, if any, um, if anyone's having any issues or has questions regarding the FES IMS and the general kind of process here, uh, feel free to reach out uh, to us. I'll actually, I'll put my email in the chat for anybody to uh, feel free to email me regarding, if you're having issues with um, kind of getting signed up on the website and with any of the technical stuff, we can definitely help you with that. I just uh, also put your information in the chat, Brian, for anybody who wants to reach out to you. I, I don't see any other questions. Either we were incredibly clear or you're going to get a lot of questions after this. I'm hoping we were incredibly clear. <laughs> Does anyone have any additional questions that they would like to ask? Well, maybe while you're waiting for some more questions, at least I could just make some concluding comments uh, for myself. Um, Absolutely. First of all, I would like to thank Price Waterhouse Coopers and um, the staff, Nino and, and Dan, and and several others um, in the organization. They have provided a lot of wonderful service to to FES and and to the project proponents in administrating the projects and performing some oversight. We couldn't do what we do and for the benefit of the people and communities in British Columbia with the FAST program without PwC. So I just want to, to thank uh, the folks at PwC so very much for the, what they do for us. Um, I'd also like to thank Brian Watson. Uh, Brand new, he's only been like two, maybe three weeks now, on the job. Um, all of our experienced previous operations managers are not here um, due to retirement. We still have Gord Pratt, who you know and love, but Gord's currently on a, a vacation. So it's just left it up to Brian and he's performing magnificently, um, filling in when all the others are, are gone. So good job. Brian, and thank you. And I also want to thank Elise and talk about uh, the great work that she does to communicate the, the good news stories and uh, the good work that, that you folks have done, those that are previous uh, recipients of FEST funding, and hopefully all of you that will soon become recipients. Um, and I just wanted to explain the, the business purpose and the rationale behind having such a high profile communications programs, because I'm, I'm guessing that most of you wouldn't have seen uh, the scale of communications that you've seen from FEST. And the reason we do that is because we want you, your, you know, if you're a licensee or if you're a community wanting to do work in the forest adjacent to your community, we want to help you earn the social license. And as we all know, it's, an absolutely a critical component to be truly successful if we want to undertake forestry pro projects in this province. And so that's why we communicate. We communicate often, we communicate effectively, 
we use multiple channels and we get a, a lot of uptake in, in, in the, the communications with the, the media, which is our primary vehicle and through the testimonials. And so those of that have worked with us in the past, you're, you probably become accustomed to Elise and her team uh, pestering you for, uh, you know, getting quotes, uh, getting the story in your own words. And, and I just wanted you to understand and appreciate exactly why we do that and why it's so important. And for those that are new to the program, uh, what you can expect. And so thank you, Elise, for supporting uh, the, the uh, communications program for FES. And again, thank you to all the participants. Uh, your, your interest is greatly appreciated. We, we want you to be a happy and satisfied customer. We want you to be successful. We want to assist you to do these projects and provide the benefits for wildlife, for our, our, our environment and, and for our citizens. And uh, we, we look at you as a partner. And I also uh, you know, would be remiss if I didn't thank the Ministry of Forest. First of all, for going to bat and getting the funding uh, for FAST, Minister Conroy and a whole bunch of people in working in the background in Victoria to support that process. And also thank the Wild, BC Wildfire Service and the, the operation, what they call operation staff, which is regions and districts, uh, uh, part of the Ministry of Forest. They all work, uh, uh, their work is critically important to, to the success of FAST and to your success. And, um, and I want to thank them. Hopefully there's a few of them on the call and, and they, they, they've heard that expression of gratitude. So thanks for, at least for allowing me a few concluding comments. Are there, are there any more questions that have come in since? Uh, there are know? no additional questions, no. Wow, that's shocking. <laughs> well, we, maybe we could just talk about something fun. And Nino, I don't know if you guys can see the small screen, but he has a bunch of guitars hanging on the wall in his background. And apparently Dan plays drums. So we were joking that we could provide some halftime entertainment for the crowd here today. But then we, I guess, wiser voices said, well, maybe we shouldn't. These are pretty serious folks and they, they just want their money. <laughs> they didn't come here to be entertained. We could take a vote. I could get a poll going here. Uh, rather yeah, well. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you make the final concluding comments, Brian, but uh, for me, um, yeah, you're always welcome to, to utilize the, the FAST operations managers uh, to, for support uh, during the application stage, and, and hopefully you'll also be contacting them, you know, as you're, you're completing the projects successfully and, and um, yeah, so give them a call. That that's what they're there to do is to help you. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And and you know, there's there's different uh, there's different funders now. Uh, we're all trying to accomplish the same thing, which is to pre protect our communities. Um, so I'm lucky to work in a in a district where we've got Grant Brown. Uh, Travis Emsland, uh, Mike Morrow, you know, guys that are all tackling this, this work uh, in the bullpen, if you will. And it all starts with a conversation. It all starts with, you know, presenting your, your ideas to, to groups like that, you know, fire specialists, uh, investment specialists, and, and stewardship foresters to, to make sure we're doing the most work uh, and, and the best work we can. Um, there's always limited funds. Uh, but I think, you know, with the right conversations and the right people in the room, we can, you know, make sure that the work is being directed to the right place. Um, Graham and I were chatting a couple weeks ago and, you know, it, it's, it's not a matter of just looking at a polygon, uh, but it's looking, you know, outside of that, looking at the, the whole chance, if you will, you know, like where, where does it make a logical sense, uh, you know, from a ge geographic point of view? To, to clean up the fuels. Do you take that one, two polygon with a little bit of three, four? Yeah, we do, I think so. So let's, you know, let's use the people um, that are dedicated to this work and um, have the good conversations and, and do the, the best work we can. And uh, yeah, we are pretty lucky to work with PwC. Um, 
I've never seen a communication group like Elise has here. It's it's pretty amazing in, in FAS. Uh, so I look forward to working with, with you guys and, and everyone else uh, over the coming years. So thanks for your time today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.